Although it's something that obviously you wouldn't ever want to do, plan for the end of the life of your child. Um, I, I think it is really important because it, it's facing the reality that that's what's going to happen. Um, and it gives you, it almost gives you a chance to embrace that, although it's the scariest thing in the whole world. If it's done safely and lovingly, it can help you prepare both like medically and also emotionally and spiritually that this is what is going to happen. You can, you can make it as nice as possible. It's part of your journey with your child as much as bringing your child into the world is, is something you want to do beautifully with your birth. You make your birth plans, you have an idea what it's going to be like. When it actually happens, the birth, it could go any way. Same with the end of life and the death. If you've had a chance yourself or and with your child, if your child's able to be, you know, involved in that decision making, you can at least get the essence of, of how you want it to be. You know, for, for me and Billy Rose, I always knew that I wanted it to be very loving and very comfortable and peaceful, mixed alongside always giving her a fighting chance as, as much as possible. When you're talking about end-of-life care, which is documents, um, the anxiety of the parent, obviously, possibly the child, but also I think there's an anxiety from the professional's point of view because they know they're going to go to that meeting and they're going to have to talk about these very difficult things. Parents may become upset, probably will. Um, and I think I used to dread those meetings, even though they were so sensitively done, even though we respected and, and you know, were very grateful for all of the help we were having. Essentially, you're talking about your child's death. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, it's the last thing you ever want to talk about. And so for me, there was always a, a dread about that meeting and how that was going to go, which then led to feeling absolutely drained afterwards. But I would guess that that's also true of the person coming to ask the questions and that, you know, to sort of know that you're going to pr prompt those really difficult feelings in a parent and then to have to write things down and to have to... And, and I think that from the point of view of the professional, I think if, if they know that that's a good job done and they've done it as well as they can, then it will never be easy for either either party but it, at least that work is done and when the meeting was over I was always absolutely drained but also relieved that it was done and it was out of the way. Personal experience of our experience with the end of life planning um, happened at first in hospital in NICU so um, when Billy Rose was born it's very precarious at first we stayed in NICU for a long time and also uh, the nature of her condition meant that she could die at any moment so I think there was an urgency on everyone's part to get this document done and and in a way maybe that was one of the things that I felt about it was that that it's a little bit top heavy on we need to get this piece of paper done and we need to know about your wishes around DNR and intubation or this that and the other whereas I was really attempting to have every moment that I could with Billy Rose in a very loving, happy, joyful way. Um, and and sometimes there, there was, you know, this sort of overshadowing of her imminent death that I had to really battle with. And I think, you know, the, the document coming in as a sort of administrative tick the box, exercise could have been, could have been diminished really in, in ways. So I think, first I wasn't quite prepared for what the document was. I didn't really understand, this is the wishes document, what was going to be entailed. I think it would have been useful if I'd been shown the document before I went into that meeting. I think it would have been good if I'd had preliminary chats just with nurses that I was getting on with. Oh, we're going to be talking about this. You're going to be thinking about situations where you might want 
medical treatment or you might not, you know, that it was that kind of idea, a bit more preparation. The second thing I think we were talking about just now was not always being clear what the options are. So I felt, first of all, and we had twin daughters, Francesca and Josephine, and Francesca died first. And when Francesca died, she died at home. But it wasn't one of the options that we had chosen. I, I think I sort of felt that I had to, it's not that I had to say what I was expected to say, but I, I hadn't, because we'd never been through it before, I didn't know what the choices really truly were. And so on our end of life care plan, I always used to think, well, yes, probably we would want to go to the hospice because we had not spent a lot of time in hospital. And I absolutely didn't want end of life to occur in hospital. Um, and so we used to tick that box and I always used to worry about it and think, oh, how will that happen? And will that, is that the right thing? And felt that it was really the weightiest decision that I had ever made. And then as it turned out, Francesca made up her own mind and she died in the peace of her own home and, and that felt absolutely right at the time and the community team we had around us were so supportive that there would have been no point in trying to rush somewhere else when she had all of the calm, all of the care, all of the sort of security of being in the right place with people she knew, loved her and, and knew her. The, the bits I really liked about the document was the wishes for life you know that it doesn't just have to be top heavy again on this okay you know and if she's about to die are you going to just let her die or not die so much focus on the death like I really want to say that you know when you're given the information that your child's going to die you don't ever forget it it's never gone and any hope that you raise you, you know you always know that they're going to die and there's room in that document to really look at fulfilling your child's life and really giving your child the best quality of life possible. And it does say it, it does have it, you know, wishes for the life. And 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 I, I think, you know, that could be emphasised a little bit more. You know, like, right, here we are, we've got this moment, we've got this life here and now, what we're going to do to make this the best? How can we make it the most comfortable, both medically and just generally in your life? And um, and even even kind of reviewing the document like that is quite nice. Oh, what have we achieved? You know, for, for, in Billy Rose, it's very simple things like, oh, let's just get her out of hospital so she can feel some sunlight on her face, or even raindrops on her face, smell a flower. It's really simple. A bit more on that, I think, gives you a bit more of a sense of empowerment in a situation that is totally out of your control. What we hadn't factored in was that we needed to be cared for a little bit more when we lost our second child because we didn't have any other children and so when Francesca died, although it was absolutely devastating, we still had to look after Josephine. And we still had people coming into our home and we still had medicines and feeds and changes and getting up in the night and seizures to manage and all sorts of appointments. And so it was almost the, the grief had to be on the back burner a little bit. And when it actually came to the point where she she was deteriorating and I did know this wasn't just bronchiolitis or epilepsy or now this is her saying she wants to go now everybody involved knew that the you know that the most important thing was to be holding her to be loving her to be having eye contact to be making the environment really nice and and you know I, I, I could have stayed at home we could have gone to the hospice but Actually, it was happening quite quickly, and we were in hospital, and 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 it was and and yeah, her, Billy Rose's end of life was beautiful. We always knew that whatever happened, it would be okay in terms of the fact that we were well catered for, and if if Josephine died at home as Francesca had, then the team was in place, and we knew that that would be okay. And in fact, that was what we favoured and expected, but. Um, 
our children weren't going to have what we expected. And so, and, and I think in the end, that was good because they did, they had their own identity even around their death. But of course, you can't choose that. Um, so I think some really simple messages just reinforced and given kindly make a lot of difference to a family. For the professionals that um, are doing an end of life plan with families and children, I would say to them that I I know how scary it is, and that everyone going into that is is frightened and scared that they're going to say the wrong thing, say the right thing. This is a very delicate issue to be addressed, but um, but to take some some comfort in that that everyone is feeling a bit frightened and to be courageous to address it um, because if they can make the space safe, if they can make the document less scary, then they're actually helping to empower the parent and the children to confront this reality that's going on. Um, and it's scary for everybody, of course it is, you know, um, you know, to so take, take support from each other in that and keep and keep learning each time you do it you'll learn more from the family you can you can go back to like how did, how did that go was that okay for you was this a bit and, and and it's always always about asking keep keep learning keep addressing the different aspects of you know your emotions that come up with it um and we can get it better and better each time can't we I think one of the things that I felt was that sometimes we were given information and we didn't take it on board straight away. Um, and so I suppose the advice would be to reinforce and to be kind and to be sensitive, but to to reinforce messages, and particularly if a family looks as if they haven't taken it on board or maybe seem blank or maybe seem to be sort of passing something aside, because it's not a tick box exercise. It's not just to pass on that piece of information like a relay. It's, it's about the family taking it on board. And the professional, I think, knowing that the family have taken it on board and that they understand the implications of anything we're speaking about. There's a lot that needs to be explained I mean, words like intubation, you know, for me was, uh, what is that? What does that mean? What, what's it going to entail? And at the point when you have to make that decision, you're going to have to make it quite quickly because it's often, it'll be in a crisis situation. So to have had an idea for it to have been explained properly, you know, what things like DNR mean, what intubation means, what putting on the ventilator will mean for you and that child. You haven't got time for it to be explained right there in that moment. Whereas if you've got that understanding before, when it comes that moment, you're like, aha, this is this, isn't it? And then in that moment, you can decide whether that's what you want to do or not. And I think that sometimes when a message is very, very difficult, and, and certainly end of life planning is, is the most difficult thing a parent will ever have to do, the only thing you really want to do is just make loud noises in your head and, and not hear any of the messages. And, and that's a natural instinct. So I think it's not necessarily that a parent is being uncooperative or resistant, although maybe that's what it seems like. Um, I think that parents just don't want to think about that awful time. And there's such um, an instinct to just block everything out. And I think even unwittingly to do that. You can use a document to really plan how you want to live the life that you have. You can quite, you can focus on those positive, what can we do? What do you want to do? How can we make this life beautiful whilst it's here? You know, and everyone, everyone can join in that, the whole family, the professionals, everybody. And really there is an opportunity there to, to celebrate the life that you have here and now. Um, and incorporate that into the end of life. But again, you can embrace the end of life wishes as well, you know, how to make that beautiful, joyful, rather than just all this scary, scary thing that you don't want to happen. It's like, it's happening. How can we make this the best for everybody? So yeah, 
just to kind of switch it from that scary thing into a, here we go, look, we can really look at this and embrace it and try and do it in a really loving way. Just wait for the right time. I think it is important, but it's always going to be a really difficult thing. And sometimes I think we probably had end of life planning when I didn't realise we were having end of life planning. And that's another skill to just be very gently talking around a subject. It doesn't have to be um, laid out on the table. This is our end of life plan. Let's get to it. I think sometimes you can just catch an, uh, an opportunity. It's not about just passing a piece of information and then not holding it anymore. It's about looking at how you can just check that a parent has understood that or a carer and, and then just be kind and sensitive and, and clear. It needs to be really clear because it's difficult. Don't sort of dress it up. It has to be a clear image because, or a clear message because otherwise... Parents aren't looking to play games at that time. They need to be sure of what they've heard and they will doubt what they've heard probably. And so I think sometimes it may take another appointment. It may take a follow-up. It may take a phone call. It may take a home visit just to sort of talk through those things again. It may take revisiting paperwork and just going through the choices again. And all of that is time well spent. I think it's, it's not about speed of delivery. It's not about getting rid of the information that you don't want to be carrying. It's about making that as easy and, um, and clear for the parents or for the carers as possible. I can remember our GP saying to me, don't worry about this because this is a fluid document. And I think those words, this is a fluid document which can change at any time, right up until the last breath of your child. Whatever you write down doesn't have to happen. We knew that anyway, but I think there's still the sense of responsibility about, oh my goodness, we've made choices and how will that work out? And for her just to have that very simple line, this, this is a fluid document, you are in charge, you are the parents, as long as you're not doing anything reckless and you're supported by the medical team, then you can change your mind about these things and we can be guided by the child, really. I mean, we were always guided by our children. And, and so I think I would say to someone who was maybe training, that's a really good line to have up your sleeve because it just made some of that anxiety go away, some of that sense of weight go away and really there's so much weight around having a life limited child and there's there's so much weight around knowing that you're going to lose your children you don't need any more the one thing that comes to mind for me for professionals is what a privileged position they're in this is oh daunting and scary but it's, you know, and massive but within that you're in such a privileged position to help cherish this precious life that you've got in front of you, to help support this family in making the most out of their short life. And, and yeah, it's the privilege that, that you're in to, to be there at the, at the end of somebody's life as well. It, it's, it's a remarkable, remarkable place to be. And I think really embrace that and really feel strong and confident and really cherish that you're there with these families and these children on that journey. And um, yeah, enjoy it, help make the most out of it, help make it loving and beautiful. Be brave, courageous, 